So tonight, we're going to talk about divine health, which goes beyond divine healing. So let's look into the scripture. Now, if, if anybody has been struggling with the concept of divine healing, this may help. Because like anything, um, well, when I was studying time management, one of the things that if a person wanted to accomplish their goals, they needed to do was have clarity and focus. And a lot of people don't get anywhere because they don't have a clear goal, place where they are going. Well, in the Word, if you understand that God really, His will isn't healing, that we keep getting broken and repaired. His will is health, that we get finally to where we walk with Him, His divine life flows to us, and we just don't get sick. Yes. But not just not getting sick. We walk in the vigor and power of the Holy Ghost. Yes. So, what I want you to do tonight is just kind of open your heart to, to where God wants to take us. And even when He takes us to health, that's only a stepping stone to the ultimate goal. But it's a good one. So if you want to get the result, you got to have a clear understanding of the goal. If, for example, if you were in school and you took a class without clarity of why you were taking it, well, how it fit into your, in, into your goals, you're not going to get much out of it. In sales, if people, we always taught people a confused mind says no. In other words, we would give them a choice between two things, not, do you want it in black or do you want it in white? You would never hand them a color palette and say, which one of these do you want? Because what will happen at that point is that I need to think about it. You know, people can make one clear decision at a time and you help kind of lead them in the right way by, by helping them make the, by giving them a choice between two things till they get where they need to be. So in the same way, a confused mind says no. If you're dealing with the scriptures, if you're dealing with anything in your life, if you aren't clear, if you think, mm, I'm not quite sure about that, then what's going to happen? You don't have the clarity and focus you need to walk an overcoming life. So James puts it another way. In James 1.6 he says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What's a double-minded man? Somebody that goes back and forth between two opinions. They don't have the clarity of truth. They don't know where they're going because then when something comes in their way, they go, well, gee, I wonder if God sent that or the enemy. But if you know, if you're clear about God's ways and where you're going, you know whether you ought to rebuke it or thank God for it. A double-minded man, it says, is unstable in all his ways. People go, one day that's God's will to heal, he's a great healer. And then the next day, well, this, this affliction is because God wants to teach me something. That's a double-minded man. Is God a healer or does he afflict you? You know, those are, and, and when you're clear on that, then you can go forward with vigor, you can go forward with energy, you can go forward with faith. So how do we get the clarity then? That would be a good question. And uh, it's very simple. You've got to focus on what God says about any situation. How do you know what he says about any situation? His word. Yes. He gave that to us as a guidebook. He gave that to us so we wouldn't have to wonder what his will is. His will is laid out in his word. His word is his will. If it says in the word to do something, that's God's will. You don't have to pray about it. You just have to obey it. And so when we're talking tonight, it would be very important if you could take notes and then go back and look the scriptures we're going to talk to up for yourself and meditate on them for yourself. For clarity and faith, you need to know within yourself that you are standing on the promises of the eternal word of God. 
There's no other place to stand that will support you in any situation. Now, how do we move forward then in clarity and how do we get that assurance? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Like for anything, the first thing you do when you have a question or a challenge, you go back and find it in the Word. What does the Word say? For example, in Psalm 107.20, He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. God sent His Word, why? To heal. He sent to, to deliver. When Jesus, who was the Word incarnate, came, what did He do? He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. God's Word is a healer. God's Son was a healer. God Himself is a healer. He put healing in man to start with. And so what kind of people, if we're His sons, if we're created in His image, then what should we be? We should be healers too. Now after you find the promise in the Word, the next thing is to believe what you find there. See how simple this is? And now believing is something. It says in Romans 3 in verse 4, God forbid, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you might be justified in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged. So when something comes your way, if you're clear about the will of God, you're clear about the word of God, then God forbid, let God be true, but every man a liar. It doesn't matter if, uh, if somebody claims to be a good Christian, then they start telling you a story of how they were afflicted or whatever doctrine they have about why God's not faithful to his promises. Because you know, because you've been in the word, that you just say, let God be true and every man a liar. Doesn't matter how good a story they tell. Doesn't matter how they try to make it look good, because everybody tries to make themselves look good. It is not true if it doesn't line up with the word and you don't have any, any obligation to either sit around and listen to it or accept it or even do anything but destroy the works of the devil. And now we say you believe what you find there in the word. When we're talking about believing, believing means you act on what's on the word. You can say, oh, I believe, but if you don't act, then you don't believe. You just mentally assent. In the, in the, in the New Testament it says, let him that steal, steal no more. Him that stole, steal no more. So, you say, well, I believe that. Well then, you shouldn't be stealing anything. Amen. Should just be over. Not just say that it's right, but act like it's right. And that goes with everything you find in the Word. If you believe it, you will live that way. If you don't believe it, well, in the best case, you're a double-minded man if you're not doing what you say you believe. You know, another word for double-minded man is somebody that, that has a mask on. Uh, the Greek for that is hypocrite. I'm pretty sure that's Greek, John. <laughs> and um, then what do you do? You found it in the Word. You believed it. Now you've got to speak it. You've got to say it because that's what God did. Starting in the very beginning of the Bible, God said, let there be light. God speaks. In Mark 11:23, it says, For verily I say to you, whoever will say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and will not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things that he saith shall come to pass, what? He'll have whatever he saith. Amen. Who saith whatever you say? Didn't say he'll have whatever God says or that you got to pray over it. It says if you believe when you speak, you will have whatever you say. So what are we to do? We're to talk to the mountain and tell it what we want it to do. Not talk to God about the mountain. Talk to the mountain about God. And it's important that you speak it. One preacher one time said, all of God's promises are voice activated. Uh, yes. You've got to speak it to activate it. And that's what we want to do. And finally, what does it say? It says, you shall have it. So, you found it, you stood on it, you believe it, you speak it. And he says, now, you shall have it. It says in Hebrews 10.23, 
let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, without going back and forth. You know, it says that when Abraham had to wait 25 years for the promise to come to pass, he was strong in faith. He, was, he, he didn't waver back and forth. He believed God and it came to pass. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering for why? He's faithful to promise. What we are basing our faith on isn't just empty words that some man wrote. It is the promises of a faithful God who cannot deny himself. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Because God is true to himself. He can't be any other way. Now, I know these are all basics. I know we've covered them before in other teachings. And if you want more detail, you can go listen to them. And we have a website full of menace, uh, messages in ChristSteps.life, I believe it is. Is that right? Or com? It's life or com. Go to it and you'll find out which one. Life. In ChristSteps.life. And you get all sorts of messages where you can go back and study the basics of healing. Or like last week's message, you can study the benefits that God has given you. But we're just laying that foundation because what we want to focus on tonight is health. Not healing, but health. Now, divine healing and health, first of all, sometimes it helps to know what they're not to understand what they are. So, divine healing and health are not medical. They are not naturopathic, and they are not herbal remedies. They are the moving of the supernatural power of God through His Word. And it happens without naturopathy, it happens without medicine. It happens without herbal remedies. It happens because you believe the word and you speak to the disease and say go. That's why it happens. Again, the promises are voice activated. So what is, let's look at divine health now. What is promised in the word about divine health? Well, the New Testament has a really powerful promise in 3 John 1 and verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you would pr prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. You know, God said he wanted you to prosper. He wanted you to be in health and he wanted your soul to prosper. He wants you to prosper body, soul, and spirit. That's the kind of God we serve. In the Old Testament, he's El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough, the God of abundance. And he's just as abundant today. And you read in the word how he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That's the God that we serve. Now, if your goal is to have health, healing makes a lot of sense. Because if you're sick when you come to the Lord, then you get healed, repaired, and then you walk in health. So it's, it's the stepping stone. You get healed, not just to get healed, even though there's much benefit and it shows his glory, but it's not just that. It's a stepping stone to walking in health, which is where God wants every Christian to be. So, anything contrary to God's word, let God be true and every man a liar. James says in another place, James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So again, how do we do that? Well, first of all, you'll notice everything you read in the Word of God, it takes an effort on our part. It isn't, it isn't works to get us saved, but it's works to walk in the promises because all, everything opposes that. This world was given over to the enemy. All the thoughts, all the systems, all the philosophy, all the thinking, everything is in opposition to the Lord. So he says, first of all, submit yourselves to God. How do you do that? You believe the word. Then it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, if something comes your way, you get an ache or a pain or something like that, what do you do? Do you, do you just start calling, oh God, please take this away. He already did that at Calvary. Again, that's the basics. So what do you do? 
Devil go in the name of Jesus. Pain go in the name of Jesus. I am not going to accept it and I'm not subject to you. I'm submitting to God and you I resist. Flee from me. Yeah, that's what he said. He didn't say he's going to flee from God. He said he's going to flee from you. Now, of course, we know it's because God is in you and you're standing on his word and you're voice activating his word. But when you resist the devil, he flees from you. Now, people say, well, if it's God, then why do I have to work? Why doesn't it just happen? And people think that about anything Christian. It should just happen. If he's the Lord that heals me. Why isn't that automatic? Well, because God, because there's three things involved in you walking in anything of God. Number one, there's God and his promises and his will for you. Number two, there's the devil and his lies and his will for you. And number three, there's your will. Do you want to submit to God and resist the devil? Or are you going to give way? Are you going to be like a wave of the sea? Are you going to waver and doubt and end up accepting what the devil's will is for your life? That's why it isn't automatic. It's because God left us a free will. We are not automatons. We are not robots. We can choose not to submit to God. That's a bad choice and he tells us that in his word, but it is our free choice. God made us free. That's what gives him the glory is when a free creature says, I'm going to submit to you. So your will, your and the enemy's will are involved. God's part's actually done on things like healing. He did it 2,000 years ago at the cross. Now our, our job is to have and walk in dominion because that's what he gave to us. He restored dominion to us. Now, we have a saying we talked about last week, what you tolerate will dominate. If you, if, you, if you don't stand up like a soldier and a little something comes in and you don't resist it, then it will ultimately dominate you. Because he said, yield your members to Christ or yield them to the flesh. But if you yield them here, you are his servants, whoever you yield your members to, to obey. So if you yield them to the darkness, pretty soon that's just going to take over. And now it's, not, now it's not just a pain, now it's an incapacity. Now it's not a pain, your immune system is affected. Now it's not a pain, it's a terrible disease. And all of that could have been stopped at the door if you just never accepted the fiery dart in the first place and stood on the Word of God, just like we started with. Find it in the Word, believe it, Stand on it and speak it. And resist the devil, he will flee from you. And it takes this as a lifelong walk for a Christian to lead an overcoming Christian life. He, had never, pro he never tells you to be overcome. There's no promises to people that are overcome. To be an overcoming Christian, you need not to tolerate anything. You need to know you dominate, not the devil. You need to know that the light of God is within you and God is true and every man a liar and you can do it because he is at work in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Amen. So now let's go back to these scriptures of truth and continue on our subject of the night, which is health. Proverbs 4 and verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. So how does he start off here? The word. The word. Listen to the word. Listen to my sayings. Verse 21. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Verse 22. For the, my words are life to those that find them, and what? Health to all their flesh. It's not just healing, it's health to all your flesh. Get healed and then stay in health. It's health to all your flesh, but you gotta keep the word in your heart. Gotta keep those sayings, you gotta attend to them. That means do what it says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The next one in Proverbs 3, 7 says this, 
Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It shall be what? Health to your navel and marrow to your bones. This is another great, and you know, make these personal. When you read this, you're going to say, well, well, the word and submitting to God, this is health to my navel and marrow to my bones. Now, what is the navel? The navel is where the umbilical cord was attached. And that is what, as a baby, that's what brought life into you, into your body. So what he's saying here is when it says that it'll be health to your navel, it'll be health to all your insides, health to your organs, health to your lungs, health to everything inside this body. It's not just what you can see on the outside we have health for. We have health for our navel. We have health for our insides. And it says, in, it says uh, and marrow to your bones. Now, I like that one because... The marrow is what produces the blood cells. So in the bones, the marrow produces the red blood cells, which is what brings life and oxygen and everything to the body. The white blood cells are your immune system. They fight off the, def the things that would attack you. And then the platelets, if you have a cut or something, they'll go in there and coagulate the blood around it so you don't lose all your blood through a little cut. And it heals. And God put that healing within us. Well, when it says that he is, that the word is marrow in your bones, that means you have good healthy bones, good supply of blood, the right kind, like red blood, oxygenated blood, blood that gives you energy and power. You have white blood cells. Your immune system is strong. And if anything comes against you, you have a mechanism to stop it at the door. Now, in other countries, like for example in Africa, one of the things that has been uh, a real scourge over there is they have HIV and AIDS. And what do they do? They attack the immune system, and then if something, if they get even a little sickness, it'll kill them. And that, that has been prevalent over there, it's still prevalent over there, and it is no different than any other promise of God. And people that have been prayed for for HIV and AIDS have been healed and their immune system restored. Yes. So you, but you don't have to have somebody pray for you. Jesus already prayed for you. His word already promised you. Which, and you already have the Holy Ghost inside, which is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And you just say, Lord, I just thank you. My insides are healthy, and there is marrow to my bones. I produce everything I need to walk in health. Proverbs 12:18. But the tongue of the wise is health. When you speak wise words, when you speak good words, that's health. And it's health not only to you for speaking it, but you can help other people by speaking good words. Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweet to the soul and what? Health to the bones. God wants your bones healthy. He doesn't want them creaking together and all that sort of stuff and drying, drying up because you think you have to because you're older. No. Marrow to your bones. Health to your bones. And it's health, not just healing he's talking about here. So all of these things that we've read by the word, you are maintaining the walk, you are maintaining the work that God has started in your body. Now let's look at a, actually a an old favorite scripture of mine in Jeremiah 8 and verse 22. This is what he says. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of my daughter and my people recovered? Well, for one thing, in Christian circles, a lot of it is because they're ignorant. They don't have the knowledge of his word that tells them that they can be healed. Now, when it says, is there no balm in Gilead, balm was the healing unguents and ointments that came out of that region. So when he says there's no balm in Gilead, well, Jesus said, 
or the word says, his name is like ointment poured forth. We have a healing balm in Jesus. We have a healing balm in the Holy Ghost. And the words are sweet as honey. We have a healing balm in the word of God that we can apply anytime we need to. And he says, is there no physician there who's a great physician? It's Jesus. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I took your sickness. I bore your sin. So when it says all of that, it says, then why isn't the health, not the healing just, but the health of my daughter recovered? Now, this balm here, these healing ointments, I want to read you scripture where this appears somewhere else in the word. Way back in Genesis uh, 37, 25, when the sons of Jacob were kind of camping out, and it says, and they, they sat down to eat bread and lifted up their eyes and they looked and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. So Gilead was long known as a place of healing balm. That's why the Lord said, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no balm in this new covenant? Is there no balm in this land which I have given you, which is a land that flows with milk and honey? There is. And there is a physician. So we got the, unguent, the name poured forth. We've got the physician, Jesus himself. I mean, what more do we need to walk in health? Jeremiah 30, verse 17. I will restore health unto thee. See God's will? Not just healing, health. I will restore health to thee, and I will heal thee of your wounds, saith the Lord. So the Lord's will is that we have our health restored and that we we have healing for any wounds that we have and by the way that doesn't just mean physical that can mean on the inside mental spiritual Jeremiah 33 6 behold I will bring it health and cure and I will cure them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth that's what the Lord says not only am I going to bring you, I'm going to bring you health and I'm going to bring you cure. I'm going to cure you. Whatever the sickness, I'm going to cure you. And I'm going to bring you health. And I'm going to reveal to you the abundance of peace and truth. You know, when you have, when you're sick, when you're afflicted, you don't have the peace that you need to walk in. Because you're, it's, there's always that little battle on the outside. When you're walking in health, you're walking in peace. When you're walking in health, you're walking in truth. In, uh, now, in, in Isaiah, we see that our health is linked to walking in the light, which only makes sense. The light of God is healing. There's no darkness in the light of God. It's the greatest disinfectant ever known. It is the light that destroys darkness. And that darkness can be sin. That darkness can be sickness. That darkness can be anything dark. The light destroys it. Isaiah 58, verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and your health is going to spring forth speedily, not slowly. Not, you know, back in, the, in Deuteronomy, it said that one of the curses was, was sickness that was of long continuance. Here it says, your health, your cure is going to spring forth speedily. That's a good one to stand on. You know, it says, we'll run and not be weary, walk and not faint, soar on wings like the eagles, and our health will spring forth speedily. Yeah. Now, last week, we uh, like we talked about the first of this one, we need that clarity of purpose, which is that God wants us in health. So, is, what is the greater purpose of health? Well, last week, we went through Psalm 103, the one that starts out, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. And verse 3, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, and on and on. But then you go down to verse 7. He says, he made known his ways unto Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. And this is why, this is why people need a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of God. Jesus came and laid his hand on people or spoke to people. They were healed. And most of the children of Israel just saw his acts. Oh, he healed them. But Moses knew his ways. 
that act was because I am the Lord that healeth thee. It reviled the very nature of God himself. That's his way. So God's way is always to heal. God's way is to always have us walking in health. God's way is to cure us. That's his way. All the everything else that happened is just an, it, if all you see is an act, well then, today he heals, maybe tomorrow he doesn't. You don't understand the ways of the Lord. But what God wants us to do is he wants to make known his ways to us, and he does that through the word. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Jesus said healing means that the kingdom of God has come near you. Power of God, the Holy Ghost, the light of the Lord. It says in Psalm 61, or 67, verse 1, God, be merciful to us, bless us, cause your face to shine upon us. There's that light. Verse 2, that thy way may be known upon earth, and what? Thy saving health among all nations. You see what this says? God wants his way to be known. He wants his people to stand up and know that he is the Lord that healeth thee. So when they pray for some, but when they command sickness to go, it goes. When we walk in health, that shows the God we serve. It's his way. But it, this, this is a very profound scripture here. Thy saving health among all nations. In the Hebrew, that is just one word, it is Yeshua. Thy saving health, Yeshua. Some, and, and what it ha, the meaning of it is, according to Strong's, it means something saved, something delivered, it means aid, like assistance. Thy saving health, victory. Thy saving health means prosperity. Thy saving health means deliverance, health. It means help. It means salvation. It means our welfare. God's concerned about our welfare. Do we be well? It's our saving health will be seen among all nations. All of these things I just read, in us, God wants to show that to all nations. And by the way, that occurs 78 times in the Old Testament, Yeshua. So God has given us, like we've talked about so many times before, you look at all this and just because of the way things are, it's like it's almost, it's almost hard to believe. It's like too good to be true, as they say. But you know, so in the Old Testament, it would be like the days of heaven upon the earth. That's the kind of life we want to live. We want to live good days. And the word tells us how. Now let's go and finish up with an example of a man who walked in this. And we're going to talk about Caleb for a minute. In Numbers 13 and verse 30, it says, Caleb, this was after they spied out the land. Ten of the spies brought a bad report. Oh man, yeah, there's a lot of good fruit in that land, but there's walled cities. The son of Anak were there, which were the sons of the giants. And he says, and, but Caleb turned around and he, he tried to, the, the stir went out amongst the people, the fear. And Caleb tried to, to still them. And he said, look, let's go up at once and possess it. He wasn't denying there were those obstacles. He said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. He didn't, it wasn't, God was greater. This is like David and Goliath. I go up and take care of Goliath. Who are you that comes against me with a sword and a spear? I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And that's who Caleb believed in. He said, let's go get it. God has promised, let's go get it. In, number, in the next verse, 31. But the man that went up with him said, no, we're not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched to the children of Israel. And so what did the Lord say about this? He said, verse, uh, four, chapter 14, verse 23, Surely they shall not see the land that I swear to their fathers for bringing up that evil report, for doubting, for not standing and saying, 
I serve the God of Israel. I said, the God that parts the Red Sea, the God that preserved us for 40 years in the wilderness, or well, he hadn't done that yet, the God that preserved us in our journeying to Mount Sinai, that God, he's greater than those giants, he's greater than those cities, and he's the one that said that land was ours. Every soul that, every place the sole of our foot shall tread will be ours. Let's go. Let's go up at once and possess our promise. But because the children of Israel didn't do that, they had to wander 40 years in the wilderness till all that generation had passed away and only Caleb and Joshua came through on the other side. And Moses, but he didn't get to go into the land. Numbers 14, 24. God said, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and has followed me fully, submit to God, resist the devil, He'll flee from you. He has, sub he has followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed will possess it. So here's a man, This here's Caleb, and he goes up into this land, and he, he's a, he, like, a, like this army that went out. He's a man of war. And the, a man of war looks at the enemy. He doesn't tremble. He finds a way to defeat him. That's his job. So... Caleb said, let's go up once and possess it. And God said, You've, you have wholly followed me. You're going to get to do just that. But uh, there's this 40 years in between. Mm -hmm. Now, Caleb's 40 years old at this point. And now he's going to wander in the desert for decades. And then they can go into the land. It says in Joshua chapter 14, verse 7, Caleb is claiming the land, and he says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. He said, when he came back, he said what was in his heart, which was, let us go possess the land. Verse 10, And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And he said, these 45 years, even since the Lord spake, the word to Mo, would spake this word to Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now lo, I am this day 85 years old. So he's not a young man here. But, ver verse 11, and yet... I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Why is that? Because he wholly followed the Lord. What are all those promises we read? What did they say? If you do that, it will be health to your flesh. It will be health to your bones. I am as strong this day as I was in the day Moses sent me. So here was a man who was walking in health. He was walking in, in, in divine health in divine life which that divine life back then was still divine life but he didn't have the Holy Ghost living in him like we do he didn't have the spirit of life in Christ Jesus living within him but he still by the touch of the spirit and the light of God he was as strong at 85 as he was at 40 and Moses sent me as my strength was then even so is my strength now for war both to go in and to come out. Now here's a guy who at 85 is just as vigorous, just as determined, just as ready to go to war. He is running toward the obstacle, running toward the enemy and not going, well, I'm getting kind of old here. Maybe, maybe some of my kids can go over there and possess that mountain. He said, no, I'm just as strong at 85 as I was at 40 for war. He says, now therefore, now this is an example God put in his word of how we can have length of days and they are healthy days. It's not like we read about some, you read about some of the, the people in the Old Testament, they go, oh, I've lived a long life and evil and full of trouble and can't see very well anymore and all of those things. No, this man who wholly followed the Lord, who had another spirit, who was as strong at 85 as he was at 40, he says in verse 12, Now, therefore, 
Give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there. This is the giants. And that the cities were great and fenced. And if so be the Lord is with me, I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord has said. What is he doing? Voice activated. He is speaking what the Lord spoke to him. I am just as strong today, so give me the mountain. You know, and when it says the sons of Anak, when you read about it, you know, he, they actually were the sons of Anak. And there were the divisions to, his, to Anak's sons, the race of giants. And Joshua, or, uh, Caleb said, let me, let, a, let me at him. Just like David running into Goliath. Let me at him. You come to me with man's stuff, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Amen. So Caleb is an example to us in the word of what it means to walk in health, what it means to walk in vigor, what it means to walk wholly following the Lord. Now this is just an example under a covenant not as good as what we have. In our covenant, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. We have been given the spirit of life in Christ Jesus to set us free from the law of sin and death. We've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. He wants us in health. Yes. Healed, cured, in health. And when we are, he wants us to lead other people down that path. He wants to show his saving health through us. And so when we see somebody has a need, we can manifest saving health by healing them. That's what Jesus did. And we are like him. We always say, oh, as he is, so are we in this world. Well, that's what he did. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So anything that's coming against you, you have promises in this word. You have the life of God in the Holy Ghost you have the ability to speak this word so you can walk like Caleb did and just say, give me that mountain. I'm as strong now as I was in the days of my youth. Amen. Most, of our, most of us aren't 85. <laughs> and this is where Caleb started the battle. It wasn't like he was 80 and he started the battle. He says, I'm 85, now give me this mountain. That, now that's what I like. Moses made it to 120. So that's a good next step. Let's start, let's go to 85 and then go to 120. All things are possible if we believe. And God needs to manifest his saving health. So if you're already trained to do that, if you're already manifesting it, why not let you just carry on as long as you can in the service of the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. We give you the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.